Well, hello everybody and welcome to another episode and what an episode we've got for you today. Today we're going to look at 16 FSU lenses, 16 lenses from the former Soviet countries. I think that must be the biggest selection of former Soviet lenses on YouTube, but whether it is or not, it's a pretty big selection. We're going to look at the uh, rangefinder lenses, the Soviet rangefinder lenses. Uh, they were made for the Soviet rangefinders like this Zorki 3 here. There's also the Fed 4, the Zorki 4, many, many affordable rangefinders. And they all use an L39 mount, uh, the L39 screw mount, which is the same as that used on the very early Leicas, like uh, this Barnack Leica 3 I've got here. There is some debate about whether they can be used on the Barnack Leicas, but I've never had any problem. So you can use them on a Barnack Leica, you can use them on a, a Soviet rangefinder, or you can use them on your digital mirrorless camera, which I suspect is what most of us are going to be using them for. So we've got lots of 50mm rangefinder lenses to look at and we've got some non-50s as well we've got an 85 mil here we've got a 135 mil here we're also going to look at some uh, former soviet slr lenses and they're mostly m42 mount and we're going to look at some 50 mils and some longer focal lengths also now most of these vintage lenses are very very affordable vintage lenses have increased in price over the past few years but by and large the former soviet lenses have bucked that trend and most of them are very very affordable more affordable than their western counterparts there are some expensive lenses in the former soviet lineup very few not many at all but there are a couple and we're going to look at those today as well because they are unique lenses there's nothing like them and they are absolutely unique optics which i think deserve an inclusion in this list so that's a bit of a general overview let's dive in and we're first going to look at the 50 millimeter rangefinder lenses we're spoilt for choice there are quite a number of them and they're all interesting in their own way the first one we're going to look at is this humble unassuming little thing this is the Indostar 61 this was standard equipment with uh, the fed 4 and the fed 3 cameras the predecessor is the Indostar 26 this is a Tessar lens, it's a four element lens and it's very, very cheap. It's one of the cheapest 50s you can buy. It's very sharp, even wide open, as all the Tessars are. That's a Tessar characteristic. Let's have a brief look at it close up. It's quite a nice looking lens. It's got these sort of alternating chrome and black parts. Being a rangefinder lens, it focuses to three feet or one metre. Oh, we're having focus problems. The aperture rings at the front and the focus ring is at the back on these lenses as it is on most FSU lenses. The aperture is click stopped f2.8 to f16. And it's a lovely, lovely little lens. This was my only lens for many, many years when I was learning photography years ago on my Fed 4 camera and it did me sterling service for many years and I've also used it quite a bit on my digital cameras as well particularly on the Sony a7 because I do love to shoot these lenses full frame it's a great little lens and it's available from around about 10 or 15 pounds this is one of the cheapest lenses in the world it's an l39 mount so you can use it on your fsu rangefinders you can use it on the old leica rangefinders the barnax or you can use it on uh, your digital mirrorless camera and they work very very well on those cameras you may find that you need a little bit of lubrication sometimes they get a little bit stiff as this one has but they're easy to lubricate it's just a question of 
removing this rear ring here, cleaning out the old grease and getting a little fresh grease in and then moving this ring, focus ring, forward just to get a little oil on the focusing helix. One or two drops of motor oil is sufficient. That's all you will need to reconstitute the old grease. Be very, very sparing if you do that. A wonderful little lens and a great starter lens if you've not tried vintage lenses before. Another very, very cheap lens from Indostar is the Indostar 50 and this one is still on the adapter Oop. this lens I don't know it's something of an orphan lens this one it's it's not well loved I think partly because of its appearance it's not a good looking lens it's really not a beautiful lens I don't know it's in the eye of the beholder you may like it I don't think its appearance is anything to write home about, especially compared with other lenses. It's got these ridges and kind of tapers towards the front. But this lens is one of the sharpest, uh, certainly one of the sharpest uh, FSU lenses you'll come across. One of the sharpest rangefinder lenses you'll come across. It's an f3.5 lens and you can buy it in a collapsible mount and that's a very handy nice bit of kit. Those are a bit more expensive though. In this solid mount these lenses will go for around about £10 or maybe less. Very very nice lens, very very cheap and a really good one to get hold of if you're looking for these FSU vintage 50s. Next, what have we got? The next one we've got is actually on this Leica here. I've been shooting it on this Leica. I shot it for many years on this Leica. It's a beautiful little lens, really sharp, very, very nice colours. Again, it's a rangefinder lens, so its minimum focus distance is three feet. This lens, actually, the Indostar 22, is the predecessor to the Indostar 50. The Indostar 50 is said to be slightly sharper. I've never noticed it myself. These lenses are quite common. They are not in short supply. They're also very, very easy to service if you want to. They're really, really simple. Let me show you close up. There's actually very little to go wrong with them. Really the most that goes wrong with them is the focusing helix can run out of lubricant, but the focusing helix is right. Focus please, thank you. The focusing helix is right there at the back of the lens, so it's very easily accessible. You can very easily get one or two drops of motor oil into there to free up a, a lens that's perhaps not as free as it ought to be. A really nice looking lens, as good looking as any of the Leica Elmar lenses, which it clearly apes and is similar to. A good one of these will cost you from 40 to £60 if you buy it uh, on its own. If you buy it on a camera, a Zorki One for example, then you're more likely to pay uh, between 50 to 60 pounds for the camera with a lens so that's the way to buy these lenses is is on cameras they're very often cheaper and it doesn't matter too much if the camera body isn't working or it, it, it needs a repair you've still got a nice lens out of it one thing I should mention if you are using these lenses on Leica bodies they can be a little tricky to screw on. You see if I just screw that on there, that um, lever contacts the slow speed uh, thingy. So what you need to do is turn your lens like that and then it will screw on without any problems. And it's also usable without any problems too. Let's get it fully on and show you just to prove it. So there we are, that's fully on. I don't know what's going wrong with my focus today. Yeah, so that's now fully usable on that Leica camera. Just as it is on the Soviet uh, rangefinders and um, the uh, 
digital mirrorless cameras too. A great little lens, well worth getting uh, if you can uh, put your hands on a good one for the right price. Okay, a couple more collapsibles we've got here and they are both examples of the Fed 10. Um, we've got the uncoated version here and the coated version here. This uncoated version was, as far as I'm aware, the first lens that the uh, Soviet camera industry produced in the 1930s. Um, it's very similar to the Elmer and as I've said before on this channel, I suspect there is quite a bit of Elmar DNA in this lens. I know it's not identical, but it really does make sense. Again, an L39 uh, mount on the back. Again, very, very simple construction, just like the Industar 22. This lens came to me in quite a poor state and the uh, there's a cemented doublet, two elements cemented together right in the middle uh, of the lens and they'd gone cloudy so I tried various cures for that. I got the lens very, very cheaply. Uh, I paid £5 for it actually and so it wasn't really, it wouldn't really have been a loss if the repair had gone wrong. What I resorted to in the end was taking the cloudy triplet out of the lens and boiling it in boiling water for an hour. It was a kill or cure thing. The lens was no use like that. And so I tried this and I found that I, that actually softened up the cement and got those elements back together. After I took them out of the water, they were nice and solid and tight together. The cloudiness had disappeared. I then put it in some methylated spirit to draw out all of the water. And then I took it out of the meths cleaned it up put it back in the lens and I've been using it ever since so that's a, a little repair tip if you dare they're nicely made lenses if you're buying an uncoated lens like this one from the 1930s they were made up until the um, latter part of the 1930s they were the very earliest ones were matched to the camera body just like the very early Elmar lenses were matched to the Leica bodies. So these won't mount on just any FSU rangefinder and of course they won't mount on any uh, old Leica Barnack rangefinder. So these, the uncoated version, these are best used on mirrorless cameras only. You won't have any problems at all on mirrorless cameras because all that's taken care of by the different type of mount. Uh, that you have on those cameras. They work beautifully and give you a very, very nice old school look and they're great for black and white. The coated version is, well, it looks the same, but it's actually a, a, a different lens. It, it, I mean, it's optically the same, but it behaves differently. And the way it behaves differently is that it's very, very nice for color. This is actually one of the nicest lens uh, lenses for colour shots I've used. It really does make beautiful, pumped up, saturated colours, not overwhelming, just that with that little bit of punch, just how I like colours. It's a great lens for colour and this lens will mount on any uh, FSU rangefinder or any old uh, Barnack Leica rangefinder because it has the standard register of I think 28.8 millimeters. Very, very nice little lenses. These will cost around about, they are a little more expensive, so I'd say around about 50 to 70 pounds you'll see them advertised at. A word about buying lenses don't pay by it now prices. Prices have become very, very inflated, especially after COVID. I've noticed buy it now prices, asking prices, leap up on eBay to, you know, sometimes twice what they were a year ago. And those prices are not sustainable. And anybody who pays them is um, either in a hurry or hasn't 
looked carefully enough at, at, at what else is on sale and used a little patience. Please don't buy inflated, buy at now prices. If we don't do that, that's going to bring those prices down to a generally more sane level. Um, generally, the best prices are found on auction lenses, so just a little tip. All right, finally, in our list of FSU 50mm rangefinder lenses, we've got the Jupiter 8. I have talked about this lens quite a bit, so I'm not going to go on too much about it here, except to say that it's an F2 to F22 50mm with stepless aperture without clicks. It's a lovely little compact lens, very, very small and it makes beautiful images. It's based on, as far as I'm aware, it's, well, not just based on, it's it's uh, pretty much a direct copy of the Zeiss Sonar of the 1930s, and it compares very, very well to that lens, and it also compares very, very well to the Leica Summit RF2 50mm. It makes beautiful background blur, it's very, very compact and light. They were made in a number of different body styles. You'll see one on the Zorki 3 that I've got here. This is a slightly different style of Jupiter 8. That's the early style of the lens. Gosh, the light's messing us about today. So that's the earliest style of the lens with this focusing tab. This is a later one from the 19. 60s uh, this one I've got here aluminium body there are also black body versions which between you and me I think look very cool indeed and which I used to lust after mightily in the 1970s when I used to look at Zorky 4s in Dixon's window very very nice little lens M39 mount cost anywhere between 40 to 60 pounds but look with patience the bargains are out there these are often best bought on non-working Zorki 4 bodies and you'll find some very cheap bargains there a very very nice lens so we've come to a Rubicon let's now look at the non 50 millimeter FSU rangefinder lenses. The first one that we're going to look at is this one. This is the fantastic looking, very beautiful, polished, mechanical looking Jupiter 11. And this is a 135mm f4 lens. f4 to what? f4 to f22. And again, this is an L39 mount uh, L39 screw mount lens. It's a great looking lens, apart from anything else. And I, I just love the look of these lenses. I think they look fantastic. They're really from the age of mechanism and machinery, and this one really looks nice. It's got great coatings. It's got a, it's got that purple coating, which some of the FSU lenses have, and I think. That colour coating works the nicest. Some of the Helios lenses have it, and it always works nicely when it's on a lens. I think it's single coated. I'm not sure the rear element is coated. No, I don't think it is. I think it's a single coated lens. The aperture has, goodness me, lots and lots of blades. I think there are about 14 or 15 blades in there, so it's going to make very nice, uh, smooth background blur. Being a rangefinder lens, it focuses to 2.5 meters only. Now, you might think that is a bit long, and I guess in modern lens terms, it is a bit long, but this lens has plenty of reach, so you won't really notice it in use. I've had this lens for quite a while, and I've used it a lot on my Sony A7 um, mirrorless camera, and it produces beautiful results on that camera. The f4 maximum aperture is no uh, disadvantage to achieving background blur. You can shoot subjects quite some distance away and because of 
uh, it being a long lens you'll still get some background blur it's very sharp and it's got great colors also and this is one of the cheaper fsu lenses these used to be available for around about 20 pounds there was a time nobody really wanted these lenses and they're still not expensive you can find a good one of these for 30 to 40 pounds cheaper with patience patience always pays off in this vintage lens malarkey a very very nice lens and a very worthy lens to think about if you want a lens that's got some old school look it's based on a 30s sonar and it's available at a really good price as well very very nice lens well worth looking at if you're looking for a 135 finally i think it's finally not quite finally next i should say we've got the jupiter 9 now this is an 85 millimeter lens and it's an f2 so it opens up nice and wide there are m42 slr versions of this lens also and they focus a little more closely this one goes to 1.15 meters so just over a meter um, but again because it's got a bit of reach you don't really notice that while you're using it i never felt that this lens lacked sufficient reach the m42 slr version will go a little bit closer i think it goes to about 80 centimeters but i i've not really found this one lacking i've not found the rangefinder version lacking it's a fairly compact lens it's not a big lens all these rangefinder lenses are pretty compact oh, i do wish i could get this light right the sunlight's really changing today and it's pretty challenging to shoot in. It's got a lovely big glass front element. Look at that. It's beautiful. And if I stop the aperture down, you'll see aperture rings on the front like a lot of the FSU lenses. If I stop it down, you'll see that it's got those 15 aperture blades. And they make some really nice round bubbly uh, bits in the background blur um, and it also makes nice sun stars as well if you stop it down so a really nice lens 85 mil is a great length for portraits but it's also a really good length i find for street shooting on the street i don't want to be too close to the subjects if i'm doing street portraits and this lens gives you that little bit of reach similarly with the jupiter 11 as well that's a really good street lens very very nicely made really good solid construction a very reliable feeling lens it's not a high contrast lens at least not if you shoot it fully open and it's not the sharpest 85 i've ever shot if you shoot it fully open but it's entirely usable if you stop it down it gets a little sharper of course in fact it gets a lot sharper as all lenses do stop it down to f4 f5.6 and it will compete with any lens that you care to name um but it's a really good budget solution for an 85mm lens. You can buy one of these, a good one of these, for between 100 and 120 pounds if you look carefully and with patience. A really nice lens and a really unusual treatment of colour as well. Colours are represented in a very pastely kind of way they're quite subdued and restrained they're not lacking in saturation but the tones of the colors themselves are rather subdued and rather muted and it's actually a really nice effect it's quite similar to what the, some of the pentax lenses do especially the uh, takamas the m42 takamas a very very nice 85 compact light and just a really good 
85 if you want to uh, explore a longer focal length than a 50 and a really good budget lens as well at around about 100 to 120 pounds very very nice lens indeed all right the next bunch of lenses we're going to look at on our fsu lens adventure is what does it say here 50 mil slr lenses and we've got some really nice ones to show you i'm going to start with this lens this is the carl zeiss jena tessar 2.8 50 mil and it's an m42 lens as a many if not all of the fsu slr lenses were this is a really cheap lens at the moment it was often bundled along with practica cameras this is an mtl 5b this is a really nice camera actually very simple um, with a wonderful diagonal split prism so i'll be looking at this camera fairly sooner in, in a lineup of cameras but anyway yeah this tessar was very often attached to the front of practica cameras and it was the cheapest carl zeiss jena lens that you could buy uh, as far as i'm aware it's quite a nice looking lens this is one of the zebra versions they came in different looks this is a i think a 60s one had the zebra finish it's not a big lens it's actually fairly short if we compare it to another tessar we've got here the industar 61 you can see it's actually about the same uh, length that looks about the same to me um it's very sharp tessars are well known for being sharp lenses and this one's no exception a very very sharp lens from wide open um, and it has that really wonderful feature of a lot of Carl Zeiss Jena lenses which is its minimum focus distance and if I can get this flipping sunlight right it really isn't working with me today but if we get that light vaguely right we'll see that this lens has a minimum focus distance of 0.35 meters so 35 centimeters many of the Carl Zeiss Jena lenses have these wonderful uh, close focusing distances this one's no exception and that makes them really versatile I do like a lens that can focus closely most SLR lenses go down to 60 or 50 centimeters these CZJ ones are exceptions. It's not a particularly fast 50, it's f2.8, but because it can go quite close, then you can make some really nice blur with this lens. And it may, you know, it's not so slow that it won't make blur at longer distances as well. This is a great starter lens, cannot recommend it highly enough. It comes from a very highly regarded manufacturer. It's very sharp. It, uh, represents and renders colors very nicely it's got very nice background blur you couldn't do worse than one of these and uh, rather you could do <laughs> that's really not right is it what I meant to say is you could do a lot worse than one of these it's a really nice lens and when you consider you can buy one of these from around about 20 to 25 pounds it I think becomes quite an attractive lens this is a really good lens for any m42 slr or indeed your digital mirrorless with a suitable adapter great little lens next on the list we've got an old standard it's a bit of an old favorite I have talked about it quite a bit on this channel so I'm not going to talk about it too much here however it's the grand old Helios 44. This is just such a wonderful lens. And for many years, this was one of the few lenses I had. I think I had uh, at one time a Jupiter 8, an Indostar 61 and this. And this was the main lens I used on my Sony A7 for many, many years. And I've got some great results with it. It's a 58 mil f2 to f16 
this is the earlier 13 blade version, uh, 13 aperture blade version. If you can find one of these at a reasonable price, which you very often can, I bought this one for £30, buy it because they're a bit nicer than the later ones. The coatings are nicer. Some of the later ones, the 44.2, the 44M, the coatings weren't as nice and the number of aperture blades is reduced. Still a great lens. Still a lens that I made loads and loads of images with before I got this one. But these 13 blade ones are that little bit nicer. Let's have a brief close up. There's the lens in all its silvery aluminium wondrousness. And I do like this aluminium bodied version a little more than the black bodied versions, though it is just a question of appearance. The front element is well recessed, so it's not as subject to stray light as you may imagine. The purple coatings on these earlier lenses do a great job with colour. They make colours that really pop, uh, whereas with the later versions, sometimes the colours don't pop quite as much. But I'm not talking the later versions down. They're beautiful, beautiful lenses. You can hack the front element, take it out and turn it around and you can get some very unique effects. This lens is a copy, a direct copy of the Carl Zeiss Biotar. And in my experience, Comparing this lens with a Biotar, a genuine 10 blade Biotar, this is nicer. Um, it's got nicer background blur, it's got nicer colours and it's sharper. So the Soviets actually improved, in my opinion, on the Biotar. If you like swirly bokeh, you're going to like this one because this one, like many Zeiss lenses and, and like... Uh, a lot of the CZJ lenses, this lens is a swirler, it, it has the swirl effect in the background and it's quite pronounced on this lens and it's well known for making that and it's in fact often sought out for that. I like it, it's not everybody's cup of tea. If you like it, this is a lens that will make you plenty of swirl. The preset aperture takes a little bit of getting used to but it's actually very simple. So you see there are two aperture rings, one here and one here, set the main ring to f16 and you can then control the aperture with this preset control here and that gives you all the stepless aperture fun that you could ever desire. It's a beautiful lens, I do like this lens and they're very nicely made and they're a nice looking lens too, I think they've got a nice form and a nice shape. If you want a good one of these you can find them from £30. Uh, be that the 8-blade, the later 8-blade version, or this 13, earlier 13-blade version, they can be found from £30. Uh, the 8-blade ones can often go up in price to around £50. These 13-blade ones can often go up in price to around £100. But if you're cautious and patient, you won't need to pay that. Both can be found from around £30 or so. Great little lens grab one if you see one at the right price. All right, so next on our list of FSU SLR 50 mils is, where is it? Here it is. This is the Pentacon Auto 1.8, F1.8 50 mil multi-coating. That's a bit of all right. Seriously, this is a budget lens and it's a very nice little budget lens. It's got great colour, it's nicely made, the tolerances are, are all very very nice. Check this one out a bit more closely. There it is. It looks not unlike the CZJ lenses. Here's one for comparison. So you can see there's a sort of commonality of design. The Pentacon uh, was of course an East German lens just like the Carl Zeiss Jena lenses are very very nicely made M42 mount coated I think single coated I don't think there's any coating on the rear though I could be wrong there's certainly coating on the front element though this lens is a real nice lens I've used this a lot 
the background blur is plentiful and it's usually nice but it can be a little bit harsh sometimes but i don't think that's any major criticism and it's very easy to shoot around the lens has a very useful minimum focus distance of 0.33 meters which is 33 centimeters or i think about one foot maybe just a little bit over and that's a feature of these East German lenses. They do all go, or all the ones I've used anyway, go pretty close. You can, have, of course, use this on any M42 film camera, and it works great on digital mirrorless cameras. I've shot it, uh, I think, exclusively on my Sony A7. I think all the shots I've got with this are from the A7, but I've made some really nice shots with it. It's sharp when you shoot it wide open it's not the sharpest 1.850 wide open but it's entirely sharp enough and like any lens stop it down a couple of stops to 2.8 and it becomes really sharp and correspondingly sharper uh, the more you close it down aperture blades how many one two three four five six seven eight are eight aperture blades so you're going to get some hexagonal um, bokeh from this one possibly though it does make a very nice bokeh in general a little bit harsh at times but very easy to shoot around a great little lens and a very cheap lens these are available from 30 pounds or so possibly cheaper very often found on uh, practica cameras or pentacon cameras uh, widely available and a, a real good general uh, general all-purpose lens very nice color representation just a real nice all-rounder nothing particularly special but a nice little budget 50 with good background blur and good color very well worth considering if you're looking for a cheap 50 mil let's move on to the next lens the next lens is really pretty much the nicest 50 I've ever shot and that includes FSU lenses, it includes Western lenses and all points betwixt and between. There may be nicer vintage 50s than this but I've never found one. It's an outstanding optic put simply and that's you know an entirely justified comment. It stands head and shoulders uh, above the rest of the pack it's a 50 mil f 1.8 so it's not a massively wide opening aperture but it's got background blur a plenty it'll give you a little bit of swirl if that's what you like the blur is of a very nice quality and the lens is made very nicely too this one's a little bit tired it's got a little bit of slop and a little bit of play in it even though this is a little bit tired it still performs nicely it could do with a little lubrication actually i've got to lubricate this one um, but the optics are beautiful and they're very easy to clean this one had fungus when i got it uh, behind the front element and behind the rear element they're very simple to uh, remove and clean uh, although i wouldn't go much further with czj lenses because they are more complex in their construction than the uh, rangefinder lenses that, that we've looked at. These are not simple lenses to strip. Optical performance is absolutely, well, it's outstanding, fantastic. Pick, pick your own superlative. Colours are beautiful. I've never seen a lens that gives colours as good as this one. This is one of the later non-radioactive versions and I understand the earlier uh, 1960s radioactive versions were even nicer for colour representation although this one uh, I, I really don't, I, I really wouldn't ask for better. It's just beautiful. Its colours are fantastic. It's the sharpest 50 I've shot wide open bar none. Uh, Leica lenses, Olympus lenses, Nikon lenses, take your pick. This is the sharpest, wide open. And all things considered, this gives the nicest image on balance of any 50 that I've ever shot.
It's got a very short minimum focus distance, not quite as short as the uh, Pentacon that we just looked at. 35 centimeters, but it's still nice and close and it's still a very versatile lens. It's an M42 mount. Um, they're made very nicely. They're good quality lenses and a good version of one of these, a good one. Well, usually I would say between 120 to 150 pounds for a good one. I recently saw an earlier Zebra version of this lens sell for 40 pounds and it did go for that price. I didn't buy it because there was no point. I've already got one, but somebody got a bargain there and it just shows you that the bargains are out there. What more can I say? This is the nicest 50 I've ever shot. It's the Carl Zeiss Jena Pancola 50mm f1.8. If you want the pinnacle of vintage lenses, get one of these. You won't find a nicer one. Okay, I still with us? Good. Final section is... is... <clears throat> non 50 mil SLR FSU lenses. And let's begin with another favorite of mine, a lens I've used for many, many years, currently sitting on this lovely Practica MTL5B. And this is the Carl Zeiss Jena 35mm Flectagon F2.4. This is an outstanding lens. Let me take the filter off. Very, very nicely made. A very nice looking lens and capable of making some really outstanding images. It's got a very, very close focus distance of less than 20 centimeters. Let's take a closer look just briefly. So we can there, we can see that uh, it actually goes down to, it's marked 0.2 of a meter, that's 20 centimeters. And it actually goes past that point a little bit as well. So this is a lens with a really close focus distance. There's the front of the lens. This is quite a legendary lens as many of these CZJ lenses are. It's very, very sharp. It's got that very close focus distance. I'm pretty sure these lenses are multi-coated. You can see the coating there on the front. And I think you can see it there also on the rear element too. And so these are very, very nice lenses. They're, they're legendary lenses really. Optically, this one is entirely up to the Pancola. And as I understand it, the Flectagon design informed the Distagon design of the uh, Western Zeiss company. So I've heard. Do correct me if I'm wrong, but that's what I've heard. So that speaks volumes for the quality of this lens. It really is outstanding. I've used this lens, gosh, to make many, many of the earlier videos on this channel. I've used it for product photography. I've used it for the stills on the channel. I've used it for the title shots on the channel. I've used it for everyday photography, just for, you know, just for fun. It's just outstanding. There are, there are few better 35s than this lens. A good one of these, well, Curiously, again, a little while ago, I would have said a good one of these will cost you around about £150. I've seen them go recently for a lot less than that. I've seen these sell for £100 and a little bit less recently. So I'm not sure what it is with the Z CZJ lenses, but the auction prices, uh, prices achieved at auction, do seem to be coming down little bit so it's well worth looking at these lenses it's an m42 mount it'll fit like all of them onto any m42 camera or of course on your uh, digital mirrorless camera which is mostly where i've used mine a really great lens a, one of the world's genuinely great lenses and available for 
around about a hundred pounds and that if you know a better bargain i would like to know about it that is a fine fine lens let's move on to this one all right let's look at this one this lens is a lens on its own this is the Helios 40 f1.5 85 mil it's enormous just check it out just compare it to a, a Jupiter or one of the smaller lenses this is a big big lens in anyone's book and by anyone's measure and it's a very very heavy lens as well it kind of looks like a grenade and it has a sort of a military quality it's very very solidly made the focus ring let's look more closely the focus ring is at the back here and again it's got like the helios 44 it's got the same preset aperture mechanism so again i keep mine shut down to the smallest aperture which is not only is the light battle limit today focus is battling me as well good gracious so i keep it shut down to the smallest aperture which is f22 and i then just turn the uh, preset ring to get the aperture value i want now look at that beautiful big element can you see the coatings there those purple coatings those are the coatings that give these lenses their fantastic color reproduction there is no lens that makes colors quite like this one it really is stunning this is an slr lens this particular one has an m39 mount not an L39 mount like the rangefinder lenses, but an M39 mount. And that was made to fit on the early Zenit SLRs. They had a 39mm mount, but the register is an SLR register. This is an SLR lens. So all you need to do in order to mount one and turn it into an M42 lens is put one of these little step-up rings on here like I've got on the 44. I can't turn it but anyway there's a little step up ring on there and it's it's got an m42 thread on the outside so that turns these lenses that were made for the early zenit slrs that turns them into m42s it's said the register is a tiny tiny fraction of a millimeter different if it is i haven't found it to make any difference this lens works fine on my Sony a7 never had any problems focusing or, or anything with it it's not sharp wide open in fact it's really soft wide open but this is an art lens really this is not a lens that I would count in the same way that I'd look on in the same way as for example the uh, Pancola 50 mil it's an art lens it has unique aesthetic qualities it has bokeh unlike anything you've ever seen it's based apparently on a zeiss sonar 75 mil design though i don't know uh, exactly how it's been altered or changed by the um uh, by helios um, but that's what it's said to be based on but if you want unique images, if you want unique portraits, there is no portrait lens that will give you portraits like this one. This is unique. It's often used, so unique is it, that it's very often used on film and television productions where it's in great demand. And you can very often see the shots that it's made. Um, very often I'll identify, uh, oh gosh, that, that looks like a lens from a Helios 40. And it probably is because they're widely used in film and telly because of their look. It's not a practical lens. It's very, very big. It's very, very heavy. It's got a mount, a tripod mount to take its own weight. When I took it out on my Sony a7, I was very careful not to just hold the camera because there's so much weight on the mount, I think it would eventually do some damage. So I held it by the lens and let the camera hang off the back, which puts less strain on the mount. 
So it's not a practical lens by any means. It's not a lens that will give you sharp results or anything remotely resembling sharp results wide open, though if you stop it down, it gets very sharp indeed, like any lens does. But it is utterly, utterly unique. I know of no lens like this one. If you want to make unique portraits or unique shots of any other kind, get one of these. They're not cheap. They can be bought new, although the new price seems to be pretty much the same as that for uh, an older one in good condition, and that's about £300. It sounds expensive, and it is expensive, but believe me, if you want a unique lens, if you want a unique aesthetic that you won't see anywhere else in your images, this lens is great value at £300. You'll find nothing else like it. If you want one, if you want that aesthetic, get one. They're well worth trying. Next up, we've got a lens that I don't actually physically have with me anymore because it was very kindly lent to me by a viewer a year or so ago. That's the Pancola 85mm, the Carl Zeiss Jena Pancola 85 millimeter so the focal length is the same as the jupiter 9 same as the helios 40 but the pancola bears very little resemblance to either of those lenses in the images it makes quite simply it's one of the sharpest lenses possibly the sharpest lenses maybe with the exception of the 50 mil pancola that i've ever shot it's entirely carries on the tradition of the shorter focal length Pancola. It's extremely sharp, wide open. It makes beautiful colours. It makes beautiful background blur. It's a stunning, stunning lens. It's also the most expensive FSU lens I know, and it sells for around about 600 to 700 pounds. Gosh, that is a lot for any vintage lens and it's certainly a lot for an FSU lens but if you look carefully at these images you will see these are outstanding the optics of the lens are outstanding the images it makes are outstanding probably there's no finer vintage 85 ever made if you want the finest get the Pancola 85mm if you can find one Finally, we're going to end with a nice, affordable lens. And this is one of my favourites. This is the Carl Zeiss Jena 135mm f3.5. I love 135mm lenses because I do like a bit of reach on a lens, especially if you're shooting full frame, which I do most of the time on the a7. I find 50mm to be rather too short. I do like to do portraits, I love doing portraits, and this lens is great for portraits. The optics are beautiful in the Carl Zeiss Jena tradition, there are no finer optics in a 135mm. The body is um, entirely in accord with, this, with the CZJ House style, and it, it's very similar style actually to the Western Zeiss lenses of that time. And these are very well made. Let's have a, a quick look if we can once again do battle with the sun and open up a bit. There we go. And there's our CZJ 135mm. Look at those coatings. CZJ did beautiful, beautiful coatings. And this lens is no exception. This is not an expensive lens. Not all the CZJ lenses are expensive. This is an unassuming 135mm f3.5 not particularly fast minimum focus distance of one meter so a fairly average minimum focus distance but it doesn't matter because it's got a lot of reach it's an m42 mount as you would expect just a really nice lens and the more i've used it the more i've liked it um if you want a nice 135 at a budget price, you'll find few better than this one. They're available for around about £40. And you can sometimes find them cheaper than that. Um, it's not a particularly fast lens, and so I think it's not a particularly fashionable lens 
for that reason but if you want a nice 135 you could do a great deal worse than one of these so there we are there is our selection of 16 fsu lenses and if you've never tried one of these lenses uh, i mean you've seen today many of them are so cheap that they're well several of them are so cheap that they're practically free like the Indostar 50 here a really nice lens or the Indostar 61 over here another lovely lens the Jupiter 8 the Jupiter 11 uh, the Carl Zeissiana Tessar the Helios 44 the Pentacom 50 all of them budget lenses and all of them will give you a unique vintage look to your images and you'll completely avoid the blandness that you get with modern lenses which are very technically brilliant but a little bit boring in my view so before i go let me ask you a question and i'd like to know what you want to see next on this channel i've got a few ideas in my head for videos to make but obviously it's uh, you know, no point me labouring for uh, making these videos, putting in loads of work for stuff that people don't want to see. So let me know what you want to see. It's far better if the videos get better views. That means it's easier for me to make more of them. Uh, and it's far better for you guys because these are popular videos that you actually want to see. So do let me know. Ideas I've got. DJI Osmo, beautiful little pocket gimbal camera from China. I've used this to make uh, lots of my walk around videos. It's a beautiful little piece of kit. Um, a video I'm thinking of on 135mm f2.8 vintage lenses. That might be uh, a good idea to have a look at. Would you like to look at some budget film cameras? Uh, do you enjoy the videos on budget digital mirrorless cameras? Let me know what you want to see in the comments box and I will make it for you. Let's get this thing on a good firm footing and you know, let's make let's make stuff that everybody wants to see. Let me know down below in the comments box. Thank you. So that is it from me for today. Please don't forget to like, subscribe and ring that bell before you go. And if you'd like to support this channel and you'd like to help it to grow and develop and support the work it's doing, then you can do that at patreon.com forward slash xenography. As always, thank you very much for watching and I will see you next time for some more xenography.